those who are going to be joining with us. And, and we have made some very interesting, interesting partners for the class of Steve. So we're doing some good things. We're doing good things. Minister Yours is smiling because he knows what he's talking about. We're making headway. All right, so I'm going to send this link to you um, in the chat. I'll send this link to you. So I can, let me just put this out of the way and jump into this evening's session. All right. Okay. All right, so pleasant good evening. Um, to those in, in the class with us this evening. And we are going to be looking at continuing with the UN system. Uh, let me just kind of mute. Okay. We, we are going to be continuing with the UN, the UN system. And, and, and as I mentioned, this evening's class is going to go into some more intimate details. And, and there are some more things that I will be um, kind of sharing with you in this e evening's class that are a little private. So that's why I'm not making this class a public class at all. This class cannot be a public class for that reason. Um, I'm, I'm going to, um, just to highlight you, I'm going to give you a, uh, a virtual tour this evening of the International um, Court of Justice. I'm going to give you a, a, a direct tour. You will have a virtual tour this evening. And, and I will also be sharing some very intimate information pertaining to the ICJ, the International Court of Justice, um, with you. I'll be sharing that with you. Um, so let's, let's continue. So we look at the sustainable development agenda of the United Nations arm, support sustainable development and climate action. And the, we, we find it, we closed the last class on Wednesday with the Millennium Development Goals, the MDGs, uh, which are uh, also close to 40% of the population of the developing world uh, was living under poverty and the millennium, um, the millennium Development Goals were designed to alleviate a lot of that poverty. So the 2030 Agenda is recognizing the success of the Millennium Development Goals and the need to complete the job of eradicating poverty. So one of the key things within the United Nations is focusing on eradicating poverty and looking at how best the nations uh, can come together, the 123 of them could come together and work together to observe and, and bring into focus those sustainable development goals. They're, they're goals that are put in place with an agenda for by 2030, all right? So, so we can we can look at, at that as well. Then there is the Paris Agreement. Whilst these goals are being formulated and approved, the United Nations supported the climate change negotiations, which led to the Paris Agreement on climate change in 2015. The central aim of the Paris Agreement is to strengthen the global response to the threat of climate change by keeping the global temperature rise well below two degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels or even below 1.5 degrees Celsius. Additionally, the Paris Agreement aims to strengthen the ability of countries to deal with the impact of climate change. In order to reach these goals, financing, new technology, an enhanced capacity building framework will be put in place. The agreement also provides for enhanced transparency of action and support through the transparency framework. So basically, 
what this is saying is that all of the countries of the world are looking at the changes within the, the temperature, the climate. And if you are a climate observer, you would recognize, for example, that the, the, the Arctic Circle is losing loads and loads of, of ice. And, and it's a lot of melting based on the, the temperature of the earth heating up. And there are lots of dynamics that are responsible for that. But the United Nations Paris Agreement, it has a, a place where countries can look at reducing the, the degrees and the temperature within their own um, countries. So a lot of industrial countries with with um, you know that we're using coal and, and different factories that was creating a lot of heat, nuclear uh, reactors and different things that were heating up the earth. All of these things that are too over our heads sometimes at the larger scale are what these agreements are all dealing with. You know, you hear the average person quickly shouting, oh, I'm not interested in climate change. I'm not interested. But you must appreciate that on a global scale, the world has watchdogs who are looking at all the dynamics of the oceans, all the dynamics of the Earth's atmosphere, and monitoring those environmental changes and dynamics. And if you are inclined in those areas, the United Nations will have an arm where you could get information pertaining to all of those such um, dynamics. All right. So then we, so let's look now at the United Nations and upholding international law. This one arm of the United Nations is really important, very critical. Settling disputes between states the International Court of Justice, the principal judicial organ of the United Nations is the International Court of Justice. This main body of the United Nations settles legal disputes submitted to it by states in accordance with international law. Let me explain that. So a lot of times individuals think from the outside now, if they have a crisis in their country, they're going to run to the United Nations to get the UN to try to help them. Because the United Nations International Court of Justice is the global watchdog, per se, for international justice. And the truth of the matter is, is that there's an important statement the main body of the UN settles legal disputes submitted to it by states in accordance with international law. What I mean by that is your state, your government is responsible for submitting requests to the United Nations. So an NGO inside of Nigeria, for example, an NGO in Nigeria does not have the authority to easily submit atrocities or frustrations that it is faced with to the ICJ because the ICJ answers to member states' requests in accordance to international law. It also gives advisory opinions on legal questions referred to from authorized UN organs and specialized agencies. For example, if there's a humanitarian crisis in your region, then there is a specialized agency that deals with humanitarian aid. If there's a human rights crisis, again, there's a specialized agency that deals with human rights issues. So there are different UN organs that deal with different areas of the United Nations. Everybody shouts United Nations 
and they don't understand that it covers so many different areas globally. And this is what I want you as ambassadors to be mindful of. The United Nations has organs that cover many different areas or all areas of existence, to be quite honest with you, on the planet Earth. And there are many specialized agencies that are dealing with specialized areas of influence. You have atomic energy, you have climate change, you have oceanography, you have human rights, you have all, you have education, a whole myriad of specialized agencies that work together to, to fulfill the agenda of the United Nations. Upholding international law, and how do they do that? As a matter of fact, before I go into that, let me do this. Let me take you on that tour. I'm gonna to take you on that tour through the ICJ. I wanna take you on that virtual visit of the International Court of Justice. But what I'm going to do first is I want to, I'm going to share a video with you that is um, a, a lengthy video, which is going to share with you the work on what is the International Court of Justice. I want you to, to know for yourself what is the International Court of Justice. And this is taken from the United Nations themselves. So this is not my opinion. This is actually them speaking for themselves, all right? So this video that I'm sharing with you is not my video. It's not what I can cut. It is what the United Nations International Court of Justice used to teach the world what the International Court of Justice is all about. So I want you to watch and listen to this video intently because this will answer all of your relevant questions. So let me share um, this video with you so that you are aware, all right? So please listen carefully and I will stop it so that if I need to share any information um, that I think jumps out relevant, I will do that, all right. When states disagree on where their border is. When states contest islands or a maritime zone. When one state considers that another has violated a treaty or other rule of international law. And when the UN or one of its agencies needs an opinion on a legal issue, they can turn to the International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice, or ICJ, has its seat in the Netherlands at the Peace Palace in The Hague. Like the General Assembly and the Security Council, the court is what's known as a principal organ of the United Nations and is the only one not to have its seat in New York. Okay, so take that note, very important note. The ICJ is in The Hague. The ICJ is not in New York. It is not in Geneva, it's not in Vienna. Please take that note carefully so that you speak with wisdom. It is one of the principal organs of the United Nations, all right? And it is established, it is seated in the Hague. It is not in Vienna, Austria, or nowhere else. 
There is nowhere else that you could engage the ICJ other than in The Hague, and that is in the Netherlands. Please note that if any of your governments or your, your, your peoples want to negotiate, discuss, or open dialogue with the ICJ, they have to do it in the Netherlands. They cannot approach New York or nowhere else. I am going to go through this video with you and interrupt you periodically because I want some points to jump up to you that in the class of steel, you have the wisdom and the knowledge of how it works. All right, let's go on. The ICJ is the principal judicial organ of the UN and the world's highest international court. Loco. The court has existed since 1946. Its two official languages are English and French. Its founding document, the statute, is an integral part of the Charter of the United Nations. All right. Standard languages, there are only two languages. Only two languages. I want you to listen carefully. English and French. If anybody's going to be making any submissions to the ICJ, you have to submit it in two languages, in English and in also and in French. So you need to be always, anytime you're planning an international team, make sure, and that's why His Excellency Daniel Sapuru is so important to me, and also to the class of steel, because His Excellency Daniel Sapuru is fluent in French, and French is one of the principal languages that is used in the UN system, but also in, but also in the ICJ, French is one of the submitting languages that is used, French and English. Of course, when you're there, all languages are translated and you will have translators for all languages, but please be mindful that French and English are the two principal languages. And by the way, all of you at the appointed time, I'm going to be testing you on what we're going through this evening. So I really want you to take notes so that you are all fair. All right, let's go on. Veuillez vous asseoir. All UN member states, therefore, automatically recognize the existence of the court and can call on its services. The ICJ is the successor of another court, created in 1922 by the League of Nations, the Permanent Court of International Justice. Now, the ICJ is a successor, okay? It's a successor of the League of Courts that was before it. I want you to recognize that this is not a system that is now being implemented. This is now a successor to a system that already existed prior, but it now has become more prominent, relevant, and it also continues to build in alliances globally. As you know, there are within the UN system 193 countries, and they continue to sign on more countries that are observe, recognize, and submit to the authority of the decision of the court. Are you with me? So please appreciate that there are some situations where some countries will agree that the outcome of the court is the final decision. So sometimes countries will have issues and when they go before the, the ICJ, the decision of the ICJ is accepted as final and so they will always be a loser in the situation. And when other countries see individuals working harmoniously, even though there was a contrary opinion, the reason why they work harmoniously is because they went through the process of the ICJ and they have come to a level of agreement based on going through the court and the decision of the court is final and accepted by both parties. How many of you get what I'm saying? 
I, I want you to, to appreciate the structure and the value and the respect that the core holds globally. Between 1922 and 1940, the Permanent Court handled around 60 cases. It was dissolved after the Second World War. The ICJ succeeded the Permanent Court on the 18th of April 1946, inheriting not only its statute, but also its jurisprudence and traditions. Like its predecessor, the International Court of Justice has two roles. The first is to decide disputes between states. These are known as contentious cases. The court's second role is to respond to legal questions submitted to it by the General Assembly, the Security Council, and other UN organs or agencies. These cases are known as advisory proceedings. Since the court was established, it's dealt with a large number of cases. Okay, key point, key point to know about the ICJ. It has two principal purposes. And the one that I want you to be mindful of is dispute between states. That's all. The member states are the only persons who have an opportunity to engage the ICJ because it settles disputes between them. Are you with me? So I cannot settle a dispute between persons or organizations that are not under my umbrella. So bear in mind, the ICJ settles dispute between its member states. And, and it also answers questions and concerns for all of the other relevant organs and bodies within the United Nations. So I want you to remember that. If your, part, your country is not a part of the United Nations and it's not accepted or approved as one of the member states, your dispute will fall, not on deaf ears, to be quite honest, but there is no open door for your dispute to be heard. The ICJ is not a criminal court. It does not try individuals. Okay. Please take this note. The ICJ is not a criminal court. It is not. A lot of countries sometimes have one person that creates a lot of atrocities. For example, you might look at um, Liberia, for example, and I remember General Botnicki, um, someone that I, I kind of know intimately to some degree, who is also a man of God in Liberia. I'm very closely affiliated with those organizations in, the, in um, Liberia during the time of Charles Taylor administration. The court cannot do anything with an individual. The court deals with state against state crises. All right? And it's not a criminal court. Please be aware it is not a criminal court. Only disputes between states can be submitted to it. The court consists of 15 judges. They're elected for nine years by the General Assembly and the Security Council. Five posts are renewed every three years. Judges may be re-elected. Mr. Mohammed Benuna, Mr. James, James Richard Crawford, Ms. Joan E. Donoghue, Mr. Kirill Kevorkian and Mr. Patrick Lipton Robinson have been elected to the International Court of Justice for a term of office of nine years, beginning on 6 February 20. The members of the court must all be from a different country. They do not represent their countries. They are independent judges. All right. I, I want you to hear this because this also is important. Those judges, there are 15 of them, they get chosen. I want you to hear this. Please hear this. Those judges do not represent their country. Take that note. 
they do not represent their country. They represent the legal process for deliberating. Please understand that carefully. One judge that might be chosen out of Nigeria, he does not represent Nigeria. He just sit on the International Court of Justice and gives a reasonable judgment, discussion, presentation, submission on the behalf of the case at hand. Are you with me? Wave at me if you get what I'm saying. I can see you. Just, just give me a wave if you understand what I'm saying. He does not, you cannot approach a judge from Nigeria or Ghana or the USA who sit on the ICJ and thinks that he is going to have any value on your personal state to state deliberation. He does not have that capacity. His capacity in sitting on the ICJ uh, court or at that level is to give an impartial submission of his opinion based on the facts that are submitted. That's why he's there, not to represent his country. Please note this. This is very important to be aware of. I solemnly declare that I will perform my duties and exercise my powers as judge honorably, faithfully, impartially, and conscientiously. The composition. And by the way, he did not say to no God, no devil, no demon, or anything. He just solemnly swears to deliver his duties accordingly. A lot of people have the wrong uh, opinion of who these judges are and what they represent and why they're there. The reason why they're there is because of one, their, their knowledge of jurisprudence, their knowledge of law, their knowledge of the rule of law, their knowledge of the treaties, agreements, relationship. That's why they're there. And the purpose that they're there is to be impartial in their decision making and also to be in an environment where they add value to the discussions that the nations will have so that when a decision is made, it is made by brains that are neutral, brains that want the highest good for the nations. Because at the end of the day, the outcome of every case is supposed to bring about peace and the agenda of the United Nations, which is sustainable development and global harmony amongst nations. The court reflects the following geographical balance. Three seats on the bench are occupied by African judges. Two seats are occupied by judges from Latin America and the Caribbean. Three are occupied by Asian judges. Five by judges from Western Europe and other Western states. Okay. You hear so many people say, oh, but they don't represent black people. A bunch of just white folks and Europeans. Please, please be aware that you see that three are from Africa. And they represent those judges represent the populace globally. Five were from the Europeans, you see they're from the Asia. And then they also have the proxy uh, judges in the middle of or the absence of any of the other, but you will hear that as we go forward. But I want you to be mindful that as a people, an African people, uh, you are represented, well represented, on the ICJ and within the United Nations system. I want you to see and know that without any um, doubts whatsoever. And two by judges from Eastern Europe.
Although no country is entitled to a seat, in practice the court has always included one judge from each of the five permanent members of the Security Council. Listen to this. No, no country is entitled. There are no entitlements to be sitting on the ICJ. That's a, that's a choice that is made by the selecting committee. How they do that, why they do that, is by their personal choice as they go forward in their discussions and deliberations pertaining to the cases at hand. So always remember that it is not how uh, you have to be there. It is something that is by, by decision that they sit and take. You can't fight to get there. It's not one of those decisions. If the court does not have a judge of the nationality of the states, parties to a particular case, those states can each choose what's known as a judge ad hoc. These judges can be of any nationality and have exactly the same rights and duties as elected judges. Every three years, the court elects its president and vice president. The president chairs all sittings of the court. He or she directs its work and supervises its administration. Each year, the President presents a report on the activities of the ICJ to the General Assembly in New York. The court is administratively independent. It's the only principal organ of the United Nations that is not assisted by the UN Secretariat. The judges are assisted by a registrar elected by the court for a renewable term of seven years. The registrar is the head of the court secretariat, its registry, whose staff members are recruited from all over the world. The registrar performs judicial, diplomatic and administrative functions. The court's first role is to judge legal disputes between states. These contentious cases represent 80% of its work. In the past, contentious cases have often related to border disputes, maritime delimitation and diplomatic protection. But they also increasingly concern issues such as humanitarian law, environmental law, the use of armed force and the responsibility of states. The court's jurisdiction is general it may consider any issue of international law. All UN member states are entitled to bring contentious proceedings before the court. Other non-member states can also access the court subject to certain conditions. The court's jurisdiction thus extends throughout the world. Since 1946, a large number of states have appeared before the ICJ in contentious proceedings. States are sovereign. They're free to choose how to resolve their disputes. The court can therefore only hear a case if the states involved have freely consented to having the case referred to it. In most instances, states appear before the court on the basis of an international treaty. Only hear a case if the states involved have freely consented to having the case referred to it. Remember this. A lot of times we see the atrocities that are happening in the country and think that the UN is not doing anything. I want you to remember this note here very carefully, that states have the right to decide they will not allow the United Nations to interfere with any of its affairs. They have the right to do that. So just remember that until the, the, the state decide they want the United Nations or the International Court of Justice to court, they will not get it because the, the, the International Court of Justice cannot just jump in and decide we need to solve this problem. It has to happen at the request of the state. In most instances, states appear before the court on the basis of an international treaty.
Once the court has been seized, the proceedings take place in two phases. First, the states submit their arguments, evidence and submissions in writing. Then their representatives and lawyers deliver oral arguments before the court during hearings. Costa Rica requests the court to dismiss all Nicaragua's claims in this proceeding. Nicaragua requests from the court to A, dismiss and reject the requests and submissions of the Republic of Costa Rica. The court then withdraws to begin its deliberation. Its deliberations are confidential. All questions are decided by a majority of the judges present. On average, the court's deliberations last between four and six months. Each judgment is delivered in the court's two official languages and reproduced in several sealed copies, one of which is sent to each of the states concerned. Judgments are read out at a public sitting. They conclude with an operative part in which the court gives its decision in respect of each of the points at issue. For these reasons, the court won by 14 votes to two, reject the preliminary objection raised by the Republic. Par ces motifs, la Cour, un, par 14 voix contre deux, rejette l'exception préliminaire soulevée par la République du All judgments of the court are final and without appeal. It is to be noted that by coming before the court of their own volition, states at the same time assume a commitment to comply with its decisions, all of which are binding on the parties. Virtually all the judgments of the court have been implemented. If a state refuses to abide by a decision of the court, the opposing state may have recourse to the Security Council, which may, under Article 94 of the Charter of the United Nations, make recommendations or decide upon measures to be taken to give effect to the judgment. Given the great legal, moral and diplomatic authority with which decisions of the court are invested, it is, however, extremely rare for this to happen. The court's second role is to respond to any legal questions put to it by certain UN organs and agencies. This procedure culminates in advisory opinions. Since 1946, the court has rendered a number of opinions on questions which have sometimes received wide media coverage. The majority of these opinions have been requested by the General Assembly. The advisory opinion issued by the court in 2004 on the legal consequences of the construction of a wall in the occupied Palestinian territory was one of the most high profile in its history. States from across the globe were invited to participate in the proceedings which lasted just under seven months. The General Assembly and the Security Council should consider what further action is required to bring to an end. Unlike judgments, advisory opinions given by the court are not binding per se. It is for the United Nations organs or specialized agencies having requested an opinion to follow up on them as they see fit. Whatever the case, Thanks to the court's legal and moral authority, its opinions carry great weight. Moreover, the consideration given to the court's advisory opinions by states and international organizations in their legal practice fosters the development of international law. Continuing the work started by the Permanent Court of International Justice in 1922, the ICJ's decisions have significance which goes beyond just the states and organizations directly involved in the cases. 
On very many occasions and on all continents, the court has helped to diffuse crises, to normalize relations between states, and to restart deadlock negotiations, either through the settlement of disputes by judicial means or by stating the law in respect of a particular question. As the principal judicial organ of the United Nations, the court is an important cog in the international mechanism for promoting and keeping peace. To that end, the court very regularly hosts visits by heads of state and dignitaries. The court performs its functions with great efficiency. It can make an urgent order in a matter of days or weeks and give an advisory opinion within a few months. It settles the large majority of the highly complex contentious cases submitted to it in under five years. The court's budget accounts for less than 1% of the regular budget of the United Nations. The court is a judicial institution unique in the world. Through its judgments, opinions and orders, it lends its support to the United Nations in achieving its primary purposes, which are to maintain and strengthen international peace and security. Of course, the court cannot by itself prevent states from resorting to force, but recognized by all members of the United Nations, it now more than ever serves them as an invaluable instrument promoting peace that is at their disposal. Okay, so I just want you to be aware that that film that you just saw and its photo booklet are available in more than 50 languages and it's a free download. And the link is right there, icj-cij.org forward slash multimedia. And I, I want you in the class of steel to have access to that video. And I want you to listen to it a couple of times. It's not going to change the details, the information, the facts. I want you to know the facts. I want you to be equipped with the knowledge that when individuals speak with you, you speak with intelligence, you speak with wisdom and with understanding. My wife has also made available the Paris Agreement publication in the chat. If you look inside of the chat where we um, share notes with you, you can download the Paris Agreement. And, and that is the one that I want you to, to look at it. Look and see what it's all about. What is this Paris Agreement? What is it all about? What is this climate change that they're talking about? Just browse through it for general knowledge. Sometimes general knowledge will serve you well. What I'm going to do now is I want to, I actually want to give you a, a walkthrough of, I want to give you a virtual visit of the International Court of Justice. I want to take you inside of the International Court of Justice. Why do I want to do this? I want to do this because in the coming months and years, as a result of COVID, a lot of things that are gonna be happening are gonna be happening virtually. And a lot of meetings are gonna be virtual meetings. 
And equally, there are a lot of individuals that are going to tell you a lot of things about the ICJ and they know it and they know this, but there are places in the ICJ that are not for the public's eyes. They're very not for the public awareness for security reasons, of course, but I want you in the class of steel to know, feel, have an understanding of, of the places that we're talking about. As a matter of fact, I equally have intentions, His Excellency uh, Donald Ewers, uh, myself as the Chief of Protocol, and Her Excellency Doreen, our COO, I have it, and also for His Excellency Daniel Sopuru, uh, I have it in my heart to make sure that sometime next year, we have a trip to the Hague where I can take you guys to a tour of the ICJ. I need you guys to, to have that opportunity. Um, and those who are able to say, let's engage that opportunity. Because I want to make sure that you don't only speak from book knowledge, you don't only speak from videos, but you also have the opportunity to speak from saying, I have been there, I've seen it myself, and I've met those who are on ground. I believe that the grace of God has been on my life, that I've been privileged to be places where individuals are not privileged to be. I don't take that as a privilege only. I take it humbly as an opportunity for me to be able to know how to open the doors for others to get to go those places. So with that being said, please let me take you now through a virtual visit of the International Court of Justice. And again, this is not a video that I have done. This is a video that the International Court of Justice themselves has done so that individuals can have an awareness of what goes on, how it is done, and you in the class of steel can speak with authority on such matters. So please allow me now to share with you the virtual tour of the International Court of Justice. The International Court of Justice is the principal judicial organ of the United Nations. The seat of the court is at the Peace Palace in The Hague, the Netherlands. Of the six main organs of the United Nations, it is the only one not located in New York. Established in June 1945 by the Charter of the United Nations, the court began work in April 1946. The court's role is to settle in accordance with international law, legal disputes submitted to it by states, known as contentious proceedings, and to give advisory opinions on legal questions referred to it by authorized United Nations organs and specialized agencies, known as advisory proceedings. The predecessor of the ICJ, the Permanent Court of International Justice, which was established in 1920 and dissolved with the adoption of the United Nations Charter in 1945, also had its seat at the Peace Palace in The Hague. The palace has thus housed the ICJ and the Permanent Court of International Justice for nearly 100 years. This virtual tour will lead you through the rooms of the Peace Palace that are used by the judges of the court in carrying out their judicial functions, including before hearings and sittings. While most of these private rooms are closed to the public, this tour will give you the opportunity to visit them, if only virtually. It is here, in the green room, that the judges put on their gowns, or judicial robes, before the hearings, under the watchful eye of former presidents and judges of the Permanent Court of International Justice. A court's usher welcomes the judges of the court in the green room, and for those who so wish, assists them with robing. After being robed, it is here, in the Red Room, that the judges meet just before the start of the public sittings to discuss any procedural or last-minute issues okay. before the start I of the session. Remember that. The Green Room, remember this, the Green Room is the dressing room. Remember that. The Green Room is the dressing room. That's the room where you're robed and where you're prepared for what? 
the red room. All right, remember the green room is just for dressing and preparing. The red room is where you're prepared for in the green room. I want to, I, I don't want you to miss that. Assists them with robing. After being robed, it is here in the Red Room that the judges meet just before the start of the public sittings to discuss any procedural or last minute issues okay. before the, the start Red of the room session. Is the room where they meet to discuss before going into the session. So it's like a room now we meet now, and we're no longer the average citizens that were chosen or the average judge uh, individual. We are now robed and we now discuss the business at hand. While you're being robed, you can chit a chat, discuss, you know, but now you come into the red room. The red room is now preparing you for the business at hand when you're now going to sit inside to make decisions and hear cases. So the red room is the preparation room. The president, who chairs the meeting, sits at the head of the table. Here are hung portraits offered to the court by former presidents of the ICJ after they left office. You may recognize the portrait of former President Guerrero, who was the PCIJ's last president and the first president of the ICJ, or the portrait of Dame Rosalind Higgins, the first woman judge elected to the court. The court also receives high-level visitors, such as heads of states, in the Red Room. We are now in the Great Hall of Justice, the ICJ courtroom. Like the rest of the palace, this grand room is adorned with gifts donated by states. For example, the four stained glass windows produced by the Scottish artist Douglas Strachan were a gift from the United Kingdom. In addition, a large painting by the French artist Albert Besnard entitled Paix par la Justice Peace through Justice, sits above the doorway through which members of the court enter the Great Hall via the Red Room at the start of oral proceedings. The bench is occupied by the judges participating in a given case. The court is composed of 15 permanent judges, elected for a renewable term of nine years by the General right. Assembly of I the United Nations the and the... Here. I just don't want you to miss that. So after you go from the green room, where you are rolled, then into the red room, where it is discussed and cheered by the president of the court and everything, you have that discussion there. Then you now go into the great court of justice. And that is where everybody now is in a position to deal with the matters at hand. But I want you to observe something very interesting. One room is green. One room is red, and then the, the next room is a gray room, but it is adorned with all manner of trinkets and gifts from the nations. I want you to observe that. Security Council. In order to ensure a measure of continuity, one third of the court is elected every three years. After its triennial renewal, the court elects by secret ballot a president and a vice president who hold office for three years. If a party to a case does not have a judge of its nationality on the bench, it may nominate someone to sit as a judge ad hoc. The composition of the bench may thus vary from one case to another, and the number of judges sitting in a given case will not necessarily be 15. There may be fewer where one or more elected judges do not sit, or as many as 16 or 17 where there are judges ad hoc. The central seat is that of the president of the court or the presiding judge in a given case. To his or her right sits the vice president, and right. to his or her to left sits the deep... That is very interesting and it's a new development. Please observe the screens now. Prior, there were no screens. But please observe now their screens and equally observe the mask. 
And, and I smile when I see this so that you know that this um, presentation is very, very recent and specifically geared to those who are now going to be aware of the new norms. Because further down, you're going to recognize that they also use the technology of, and I might not say Zoom, they, they might use their own internal um, technology for security reasons, but based on video calls and video conferencing that already existed prior, but that technology is now more prevalent in this dispensation. But you will see that the masks and the screens are now there currently. of judges, the most senior judge. The seat at the far right of the bench is for the registrar of the court, who is elected by its members by secret ballot for a renewable term of seven years. The registrar directs the work of the registry and is responsible for all its departments and divisions. Since the court is both a court of justice and an international organization, the duties of the registrar are okay. both judicial so and diplomatic, court, as well as... And it's also an international organization. They're two things, two separate entities. I want you to observe that. That's very important. Don't miss that. That's very important. Let's, let's let you hear it out again. All right. justice and an international organization, the duties of the registrar are both judicial and diplomatic, as well as administrative. The seats to the left of the bench are occupied by the applicant state in a case, which is the country that brings a case against another. The seats to the right of the bench are occupied by the respondent state in a case, or the country against which the case is brought. The seats closest to the president are reserved for the agents of the parties. Often, the agent of a government is its ambassador in The Hague or a senior civil servant. The agent is sometimes assisted by a co-agent, a deputy agent, and he or she always has counsel or advocates to assist in the preparation of the written pleadings and the delivery of oral arguments. Members of the diplomatic corps, invitees of judges and others, sit behind members of the delegations, while a limited number of seats is reserved for members of the public. The booths in the right and left-hand corners of the courtroom are occupied by the interpreters of the court. They ensure that what is said in the courtroom is interpreted into English and French, the two official languages of the court. Thus, whether you are in the courtroom or following the proceedings online in real time, you may do so in either of the two official languages. Okay, so you can see that the great... there's a place for the public, there's a place for ambassadors, etc. When I take you on a visit to the ICJ, I, ICJ, when I take you on a visit, I will be not, I will not be taking you as the public. I'll be taking you as ambassadors, peace ambassadors, and, and, and I will make the, the opportunity available to you so that you could observe for yourself how the system works directly. Um, in those environments, there are some environments where you have to appreciate there will be no photography. There are some places that you will go, like I have been, but you will never be able to have photographs to be clear that you were there. So those are opportunities that will be private, but I hope you get to appreciate the fact that it will open opportunities for you to get more knowledge of when you're telling individuals about training to be ambassadors and diplomats, all right? Hall of Justice was entirely renovated in 2013 on the occasion of the 100th anniversary of the Peace Palace. It now allows the court to discharge the important functions entrusted to it by the United Nations Charter with the latest technologies at its disposal. 
While public sittings of the court take place in the Great Hall of Justice, the judges also hold meetings, for the most part private, in the Deliberation Room, located in the new wing of the Peace Palace. Once the parties have concluded the presentation of their case, it is here, in the Deliberation Room, that the court holds its deliberations before reaching a decision. Although the rules governing how the court carries out its deliberations are available to the public, the deliberation process itself is held in camera or in private. The deliberations, which take place in multiple phases, last between three and nine months, depending on the complexity of the case in question and the caseload of the court. After the court reaches its decision in a given case, a summary of the decision is read out at a public sitting in the Great Hall of Justice. Since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, the court has continued to perform its functions, despite worldwide measures to halt the spread of the virus. Through the use of modern technologies, the court has made the necessary arrangements to hold virtual meetings and has adapted its working methods to the need to work remotely. These changes have inevitably altered the traditional ways in which meetings are held and rooms are used, so that the court may continue to discharge its important functions. We hope you have enjoyed this virtual tour and we look forward to welcoming you to the Peace Palace in person well, soon. I hope that you heard that last part and be assured that we will make available to you in the classes through the opportunity to visit the Peace Palace. I, I hope that this evening's presentation was helpful. I hope it was good information. And if you're, there are any questions, I will open the floor now immediately to questions, please. Uh, Lucy, I see you giving me the thumbs up, Lucy. Uh, just your comment on this evening's class and anything that is on your mind or your thoughts tonight. Uh, good evening, Bishop. Although I joined a bit late, but from the part I connected, I think I am excited about the whole thing and I'm already longing to be there by the grace of God. Thank you so much for the privilege to be in the class of steel. God bless you. You're, sir. you're most welcome, and thank you for your submission. I, I want to ask Reverend Daniel, Reverend Daniel, I want to ask your take on this evening, and I want to say, Reverend Daniel, specifically, I'm really pleased that you are here. And, and the reason why I'm equally pleased that you're here is because at your age, you might look at your knowledge, your wisdom of French and translating and everything like that. And I want to share with you that I hope that your services with us in the class of steel will lead to such a great value to the nation pertaining to your ability to translate into French. But as you learn the system, as you learn the structure, you will also be a credible individual that your nation can look to for advice, support, and assistance at any given point in time. So please give us your take and what's in your spirit this evening. Your Excellency Reverend Daniel. Thank you very much, um, Your Excellency, for this opportunity. I want to say that what you have shared tonight uh, is actually an eye-opener. There are many things uh, I did not know about uh, the ICJ, but um, your, your teaching tonight and uh, the two videos uh, have actually opened my eyes. And um, it is very important that uh, such an organization exists. We thank God for the United Nations, and we also thank God for uh, the ICJ. Um, when um, I think about it, and um, as you were 
show in those films, I really thought about, um, you know, member countries and uh, people going to the ICJ to lay their complaints and so on, and the ICJ handling this. It, it, it is very, very important that uh, such things or such an organization exists. And I thank God for, for it. So I am happy. And even it is even tonight, I, 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 I know that The Hague is in the Netherlands. In fact, I was thinking about, uh, I, I was thinking about um, uh, the headquarters of, uh, of, uh, uh, of the United Nations. But um, uh, tonight, I have uh, uh, known that uh, it is um, in the Netherlands. And again, I am happy that um, the official languages are English and French. <laughs> Obviously, I'm happy because um, yeah, that means uh, when I get to that place by God's grace, I will not be lost at all. So I thank God for it. And uh, that is it. So thank you very much for, for, for this. And uh, I believe that as a peace ambassador, I would um, be very useful even to my country. And I know that very well. I am praying that the Lord will use me in that aspect. So thank you for opening my eyes today about the International Court of Justice and um, for letting me know things that are happening. So thank you very much. So when they were talking about um, uh, those two countries, uh, they, uh, they took decision on. And another thing I learned even from there is that they are, they are ruling uh, uh, has no appeal. In other words, you cannot appeal to any other court. And uh, that is it. So uh, once the judgment is given, the judgment is upheld. And uh, we thank God for that. Uh, and and uh, they also said that if the other party wouldn't um, uh, oblige, they know what to do. They know how to handle it and so on. It is, it is a very organized system. And I thank God for uh, their being so organized. So I respect ICJ. I respect the United Nations. Thank you very much, my bishop. Thank you. You know, I, I, I appreciate Come on, let's celebrate him, the class of Speedway. Let's celebrate our elder. Let's celebrate. I, I want to, the, the important point that you did mention is that the decision is final. And, and the reason why that is interesting is because being a member um, state, you know, they only deal with the issues of member state. It's kind of like a father that has sons. It's like all of you have decided um, I'm your mentor. And there's a dispute between His Excellency Donald Ewers and His Excellency Daniel supporters. And, and I said, okay, Dan Daniel has this heated debate. Donald has this heated debate. Both of you are my sons. And both of you respect me. Both of you, and both of you respect my decision. And both of you have chosen to say, whatever the bishop decides, we will follow. So, so when I go to, to Donald who's contentious and Daniel who's contentious, and I sit down and listen to both of you, Donald has his team that is saying, I'm for Donald. Daniel has his team that's saying, I'm for Daniel. And the judges sit down and they decide what is the best for the United Nations or for peace. That's why it's called Peace Palace. What is the best decision for peace? And they look at it. And when they say, you know what? Daniel, I think that you are wrong. You need to follow Donald. You go. <laughs> but eventually, what do you do? You end up having a peace, a peace, peacekeeping mission to the United Kingdom to meet Donald. And when you fly into the United Kingdom to meet Donald, 
You and Donald share parents. Why? Because you and Donald have come to an agreement that we have a law that supersedes us. We're not laws unto ourselves. And every single dispute needs to come to some settlement. Every dispute. Somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. And you have agreed that the decision of the ICJ is the decision that we will abide by. So Daniel, being a good citizen or a good associate or a good member of the state, you, you succeed. And you, you come off of your high powers and you quit the fighting. You put your, your, your weapons down and you get what? What is called a peace agreement. Hmm. and a peace settlement, and a peace fire, because we have sat at the table and we've discussed that no longer are we going to continue war, but there's going to be a ceasefire. However, in the event that there's no peace agreement and there's no ceasefire, then we will have to create an environment where we will now engage one of the other organs that will come and support the one that we believe should have peace in the first place. And there you see now the other option when no peace can be met. When there's no agreement, there has to be something in place. You have sanctions, and then you also have sometimes <laughs> negotiations at a different level. And I will discuss that in one of our other classes. But thank you so very much for your submission, Your Excellency Daniel. And I appreciate your submission this evening in the class and also your keen observation. Well done. I want to ask the Excellency Donald Ewers for his contribution and submission on this evening's class. What, what have you received, Your Excellency Donald Ewers, our chief of protocol from this evening's class? President, good evening, Your Excellency, Dr. Don Michael Steele, and all the excellence in the house. One of the things I love about the class of Steele, and my observation is quite um, small, but to the point, is that what I love about you with the class of Steele, being our mentor, is, for example, the things that you were telling us about immigration, and um, when I actually went to Dubai, everything was put into practice. And I like what you were saying that you will take uh, me and other ambassadors to these places and to, that it becomes alive, that it, you see everything in place, that you see what's behind the scene that we don't see in public. So my taking on it, sir, that is very informative, it was very eye-opening, but I would prefer when we go and see it in person, like what I experienced with the immigration status and being an ambassador and actually put it in practice. That is my taking on it, that I love that. And I'm glad that I'm in the class of still that having these opportunities to attend these countries or to attend the United Nations, different building, et cetera, and so I will look forward, as and when we plan that, to go and visit. Thank you, sir. So, well, Your Excellency, Donald, Donald, I can say to you that you and myself and, and my wife and Josh, to be quite honest with you, we can decide one of these summer weekends where we're just going to go for a train ride on the Euro Express or a train ride and just go to the Hague because we can do that. You and I can make that personal trip, just go for a weekend. And, and I, I will do that with you because I have also, uh, based on other organizations that I'm a part of, I have been invited quite a number of times to The Hague for interfaith conferences and meetings as a speaker, I have been invited. And I think that it would be interesting to take you along with me on one of those uh, private trips. And, and it would be a very great eye-opener as well. And, and it's not that big a deal that we have to plan because we're British, mm. we have our British passport, and we can just take the, um, the, the Euro Express um, and go through the Channel Tunnel and take a trip there ourselves. So that's not hard for you and I. 
Mm. Uh, for others, it is going to demand more planning because some would need visas and, and we will have to put in place the um, application for visas for them. So it's a, long, a more long-winded process mm -hmm. for those individuals. But you and I, when you choose to say, you know what, I just need a break from the UK. Let's go for a weekend. As a matter of fact, I could even hire a car and we could drive and go ourselves. But with that being said, I just want you to be aware that these opportunities are not taboos. Don't allow individuals to create an infrastructure mentally where they become so grandeur that you find and think that they're impossible to engage. They're not. You just have to have the right association, the right connection, and just make it happen. As a matter of fact, you don't even need me. If you are in a position to book a vacation to The Hague, you can go there yourself, and that can be one of your um, sightseeing visits um, to the Peace Palace because it is not something that is hidden from the public. It is actually there where you could go and get that knowledge for yourself um, and, and to be aware uh, equally. So Your Excellency, Donald Lewis, myself and yourself, I think we should have a chat about that with my family and your daughters, and maybe we can take a weekend break um, sometime. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Your Excellency Olukoya, please, if you don't mind, give your take on this evening's submission in as much as you were aware. And, and what is your, your, you know, any comments or any questions that you might have? Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I greet all the excellencies in the house. Well, it's actually a very interesting um, um, a class this evening. And to be quite honest, I didn't know it's not in New York. I've always thought it was in New York. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's, that's the truth. And um, it, really, it really makes me want to pay a visit to that place, to the, to the place. I, I am really looking forward to paying a visit to the place. And um, uh, for the fact that um, the place, I mean, the, 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 the judges are selected from different parts of the world, and yet they are not representing their country but they are just there in their capacity as judges is also something to, to really learn from and something to be excited. And I just hope that uh, as many countries, as many states that um, are having issues can take advantage of this, uh, this, um, this uh, international uh, court, of justice to 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 bring their grievances there and 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 believe that it can be sorted out. If they can be sitting for close to seven months on just one case, I mean, and even more, and the caliber of people that are there, you know, shows that you can they they are they are, they are people that you can trust them to give fair judgment. And, and to handle things that have to do with the state. So I believe that um, um, is, 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 is a place to be and um, something that has existed for over a hundred years and still on is, is, is something to learn from. So going there, not just as, um, as a family, or, but as a class, you know, as a class, we will we'll be able to draw lessons, lessons, lessons of longevity, le le lessons of uh, a process, lesson of standards, lessons of, um, you know, how things are done and in order. You, you see the green room, you see the red room, then you see the main, the main, uh, the main uh, hall. I think there are lots to learn from. And you see, we can't just get that only from the virtual tour that we've just seen, but there is something about being there physically, having that feeling, 
and then and 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 you will just connect with something. So I believe that there's something to get when we go there physically. So I will I will I will advocate. You know, I was actually <laughs> I was kind of thrown out of the class, so I had to come back. I don't know what has been said, but for us to go there as a class is not out of place, Your Excellency. Thank you very much for this opportunity. I'm very grateful, sir. Well, well what, I'm, what I'm going to do is I'm looking at the, the current status with regards to Nigeria and Nigerians traveling and the, the restrictions. I'm, I'm kind of looking at a lot of things that are happening globally. And, 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 and one of the reasons why I'm pushing for you know, next year is because we already have Dubai. We'll be traveling to Dubai in September. Those who are going to be going on the 29th of September. Um, we also have other trips that are established already um, that are in the planning. We also have Ghana with, um, with, with regards to what is happening in Ghana. So we have quite a few trips that are coming. And next year, next year we have the trip to the United Kingdom here for those who are coming to the uh, official Leader Without Borders major summit here in London next year. And I think that what we can do is next year in May when we have that event here, we can also have a trip over to, we could do Vienna, Geneva, and also we can do The Hague because we could do that trip by train. Um, we don't need to, to do that trip by flying. We could do that trip by plane, each, all three of those are in an environment where we can travel to them by train. So I can look at the logistics of doing that and make that a part of what we will do next year um, to go to all three of them, Vienna, Geneva, and also the Hague one, in one period, if it's one week or whatever, but we will touch all three of those. So those are some dynamics that we can put in place. But I just want all of you in the class of speed to appreciate, one, we are going somewhere. Two, we're going to need individuals like yourself who are sitting under this teaching to be informed and aware of the truth. Know the truth, not, not statements and hearsay, know the truth for yourself so that you are able to be a valuable advocate for the truth. Your Excellency Bishop uh, Dr. Comfort, let's see if we have you uh, open this evening for your comment and your submission on this evening's class. Bishop Comfort for Ghana. Good evening, the house. I'm of that if and uh, your, your excellency please if you are able to family. Your Excellency, forgive me. Please forgive me for interrupting you, Your Excellency. We're not hearing you. Please forgive me. If you are able to unplug your 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 earpiece and try to see if you could speak just through your microphone, please try that because we're not hearing you. And it's the Please, uh, do you hear? Okay, go ahead, your sister. Try again. Let's see if it's there. Go ahead.
All right, bear with me. Just bear with me because I the, the past couple of classes, Her Excellency and Bishop Comfort have been trying to make a submission and have been unable to do so. And, and I think it is a little bit unfair on her and, and frustrating. So this is what I'm gonna do. Please allow me. Um, darling, could you kindly bring my phone for me, darling? And let me call Bishop Comfort on WhatsApp so that she's able to speak, darling. Please bring my phone for me. Uh, Bishop Comfort, I'm going to call you on WhatsApp so that you can speak to us directly um, through WhatsApp. I'm going to call you Bishop Comfort. Just log out and thank you, Diane. Just, just log out, Bishop Comfort, and we're going to call you on WhatsApp. Just bear with me. I'm trying to be a conscientious leader. Please bear with me. Uh, all right, Bishop Comfort is not connecting. Um, she, she's not connecting at all. Uh, okay, let's try this, just one second. Hi, Bishop Comfort, can you hear us? Hello? Hello, yes. I uh, also left uh I think this one is much better. All right, please make Which your. Can I go ahead? Um, are you all hearing her? If you could hear, her, please acknowledge that you could hear her for me. Yes, please. I can hear. Okay, go ahead. We can hear you. Yeah, I was uh, greet the house, all the SMSs, and then say thank you for uh, this opportunity to uh, present my. Of missions on the issues in their latest view. I was saying that the United Nations has been uh, an organization for some time past. As I think somewhere uh, when I was growing up, I had passion for the organization. I left the lot because my uh, uncle is on it. And then uh, my uh, late national director also uh, went on to uh, work with it for some time, for I think two years or so. So I have a little bit of uh, knowledge about it. And I, I, I believe it also has so many different departments. But when uh, I and today's presentation, though I, I was able to view this a little, I will, I'm able to have a full clear of exactly what the United Nations has for. And I, I think it's an organization that is highly uh, recognized. And it is not an organization I can toy with. And I share with all that you have seen that we must be very careful 
and you must also learn it very well so that when you tread, you tread with caution and you know which areas you are supposed to. In actual fact, I was thinking that I will add this question that if it has gotten so many departments and, and in different, different countries, I would like to know exactly where the hope is. The, uh, where the hub is. In which country is it the US in particular that all these uh, departments work around? And as a peace, global peace ambassador, which areas are we supposed to, to know or supposed to uh, avail ourselves to? I believe you are, you are letting us uh, into the various departments of the organization to to open our eyes and to also let us know exactly what is being done there. But our, our capacity in terms of being the global peace ambassador, what are we supposed to know? What, what are our take in this uh, uh, organization? Well, um, thank you for your question. And the, the interesting thing is there there is there is no there is no main hub all of the organs and all of the um, the different regions um, of the united nation serve different purposes and you have to and again i will reiterate one would have to look at one's intentions and one's purpose and one's vision and see which area of the united nation one is going to engage for the furtherance of one's objectives. For example, legal persons or legal-minded persons or barristers or lawyers that are interested in the legal side of the governments that they work in, they will focus on the Hague. They will focus on how the Hague works, how it, how it operates. Persons that are interested in human rights, Geneva is re responsible for human rights. They will focus on Geneva, and by the way, not just human rights, but a whole a lot of other things, but Geneva is, is known for human rights. Other areas, for example, atomic energy and, and um, chemical um, weaponry or, or nuclear um, arms, et cetera, and nuclear developments and technology you would, and financial arm, they are in Vienna. And, and th that's an area that you, you can look at if you're in those regions. So the different regions of the United Nations and the different arms are, at, are functioning with different objectives and different agendas. You just have to look at what is your objective, what is your agenda, and then you will find the area conducive. Now on this call, I don't think I could just answer you specifically where to be, what to do, where to do it. I think you will have to develop that according to your own personal interest. And that's not a quick question that I could answer, but I hope that the little bit that I've mentioned would give you an idea of, of what's um, potential. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Wayne. Uh, all right, Your Excellency, thank you so very much. And um, and I just did not want you to miss out on being able to submit to the class because I know that you've been trained and technology wouldn't allow you, but I'm glad you were able to submit this evening. All right, so I see that we had a hand from Lucy. Lucy, you, you raised your hand and is it please um go ahead. Yeah. Good evening once again, Bishop. I just want to ask this question. Some of us that joined uh some couple of months ago, we are not privileged to be awarded the Prince Ambassador Award. And uh, when such trip comes up, is it possible for us to join in the class of steel to travel down to the um, International Court of Appeal or something or something? Just want to, 
to clear my doubts. Say that again, please. Some of us that joined some couple of months would not be privileged to be awarded as uh, ambassadors of peace. Uh, uh, if I may, I think I should interrupt you on, on, the, on that level. You, yeah. you don't get, it, it is not awarded as ambassadors of peace. It is individuals who, who want to do the, the training and once they do the training, then they get appointed as ambassadors and then they receive their credentials. It's not oh. basically an award. It's a, oh. a training that they engage and, and they complete the training and, and then they get their credentials. So if you are interested to consider being one of the ambassadors, a peace ambassador with us, we have um, Her Excellency Doreen that you can speak to who will give you advice on doing so and, and being able to be appointed as one of the ambassadors um, for peace in light of our organization and what we do. All right, that will be fine. Thank you, sir. So Your Excellency Doreen, um, if you would follow up with Her Excellency Lucy, uh, just, just follow up with her. Um, and you know, give her she would have information. We have a training that is coming up in two weeks' time, a new training that is started in two weeks' time. And and once the completion of that training, individuals will be receiving their credentials in Dubai, and they will also be awarded a certificate in Dubai at one of the royal family in Dubai as a part of the completion of that training along with their credentials. So that's what is happening for the 29th of September um, in, in Dubai with regards to the next level of training. And there are some ambassadors who have not as yet received their credentials and they will be receiving them in Dubai on the 29th, but they will be having the added um, pleasure of being personally um, certified and recognized by one of the royal families in Dubai. Okay. All right. All right. So sorry, much, go, ahead. go ahead, I'm sorry. Oh, thank you so much. I appreciate your explanation. And I'm going to be expecting to be connected with Doreen so that we we'll get more, more information and know what to do. Next. Uh, before I go, um, Your Excellency Doreen, do you have contact information for Lucy? Do you have contact information? Yes, Doctor, I do have. Yes. Okay. I, I trust that you will follow up. Yeah. All right. I want to um I want to ask. I see that Reverend Buddy Larrier is, is on with us. Reverend Larrier, do you just want to um, give uh, your thought on this evening's um, session? Oh, it's almost 11 o'clock and we're gonna get ready to close now, but would you like to give your, your take on this evening's class, Reverend Buddy Larrier from Barbados? Reverend Larrier from, Bar from Barbados, are you with us? All right, um, no, no response. I see there's a uh, Ambrose, Ambrose, would Ida and Ambrose, would you like to, to share your thoughts on this evening's class and what you have um, observed this evening? Okay, and all right, if there, um, Alex, would you like to, to give uh, your thought on this evening's class, your take on what you observed this evening, if you would like, I don't want to walk past and not give anybody the opportunity if they would like to make a comment. Okay, 
Good evening, the cl class of steel. Good evening, everyone. And also good evening, my bishop. Well, I think today's class, I, to do, I think it was a very wonderful class and it was an educated class. I think I will, it gives me an eye opener. I think I was so happy that I was part of today's class. I think I, I, I think I, 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 I will say that this is a very great, it's a great opportunity to know all these things. Because assuming I was not in today's class, I think most things I know today now, I would have not known them. I think I will say thank you, Bishop, and thank you, all the excellency in the house. God bless you all. Thank you so very much for your, your, your contribution. Um, I'm going to close this evening with Her Excellency, our COO, uh, Doreen Barunji. Doreen, I want you to give um, your, your, what is your take on what you've learned this evening and, and how has it impacted you? Has it made any difference to you that you believe will empower you to be more effective as our COO, but equally as an advocate for the, the credentials and what you do as a peace ambassador. Uh, good evening to you all. Good evening, uh, Dr. Michael Steele, all the excellencies in the house, all our invited guests. Uh, today's uh, class has really been very, very educative and you've thrown a lot of light on the International Court of Justice. Uh, we have been, I have been watching the International Court of Justice on CNN, on, on, on television. I read it on, um, in the newspapers and I really didn't know uh, what it really uh, encompasses or about. But now I know that it is the palace of, of peace. And I believe that the nations that did not know the power of the International Court of Justice, once they get there, they feel already they're going to have justice, peace, peaceful uh, negotiation, peaceful um, dialogue, and whatever comes out of the of the whatever comes out of the court will both of them will be ready to receive it. So by the time uh, I see many African countries having issues and once they go to the International Court of Justice, the decision that has been decided upon is effected back here in Africa. Uh, I can confirm that, that uh, our country, Uganda had issues with Congo and the, the issues were presented at the International Court of Justice. And today I can confirm that the Uganda government is compensating the DRC. And that was out of the, of the settlement from the International Peace of Justice. The other thing is that I have, the, 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 the other thing that I have learned is that they only use two languages. The whole world has so many languages and how they chose those languages, well, must have been a, cons a consensus. So the two languages, I now know that I will talk to the people I will meet that they have to submit their, 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 their cases in two languages. And so the submissions will be in French and English. The other thing that I learned was that the International Court of Justice is not a criminal court. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so um, back in Africa, I can speak about maybe East Africa, that uh, when we have, you know, rebel activities and stuff like that, rebel leaders, people say, take, take that, that rebel leader to, to, to International Court of Justice and then we shall have justice. That is not the way it is done. So that one has also been knowledge to me. Uh, I thank you very much, Dr. Michael Steele. Uh, lastly, it's about the, 
the five judges that come from different nations and are very independent. My nation, Uganda, has had uh, judges sit on the seat in the palace of peace. And back here in Uganda, we say, oh, we have a judge. And so this person will rule over it, will rule in our favor. That's not true. That's absolutely not true. <laughs> Uh, and of course, the contracts run for a long time. Nine years is quite some time. That's an opportunity to transform whoever is sent there, that he will learn a lot from it and that the country will gain more from that person sitting on the International Court of Justice. So um, um, uh, what else is there? Yes, so with that being said, Doctor, uh, many, uh, many of my colleagues have mentioned many things, so I wouldn't want to have a repeat. Thank you so very much for giving me the opportunity to share from what we have all learned. I wish you guys, I wish all the excellencies in the house and our guests uh, that have come from different countries to come back and, 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 and join us on Monday and also to if you really want to learn more about what has been taught, you can visit our webs, our YouTube, uh, and also our Facebook, the Class of Steel Facebook, and the Class of Steel YouTube. You'll find all the teachings there. So Dr. Michael Steele and Jenny Steele, thank you very much for putting all this together. Have a good night and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so very much. I see my little sister Bella is very quiet in um, in in Uganda. My little sister Bella, please say good night so that we know that you are okay, and and just let us hear your voice. Thank you, my bishop. Good evening, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. We're hearing you. How was this evening's class for you? How are you? Just, just cool. This. Actually, this evening class, let me say this week, because this week was so good to me. So uh, I was not available too much because I've been sick, but I'm getting better now. Mm -hmm. Um. This week it was open, it opened my mind so much because there's a time when you think you know something, yet you don't know it. All along I I thought I knew about you when, but I I didn't know exactly what it is. But thank you so much, my bishop, for this week. For sure now I know. If someone to ask me what it is, now I know what to, what to say. So thank you so, so much. I cannot say only, only today. Let me say on from Monday up to date, you have opened my mind more, more and more and more. And actually I didn't know that I don't know. I thought I knew, <laughs> <laughs> but for sure I didn't know. Cause if someone before was asking me what, what is you and I say, I know what it is, but in actual sense, I didn't know what it is. And I'm sure some people like me are more here in Africa or here in Uganda. When you think you know something, when you actually don't know what it is exactly, because you had someone say about this, you had someone say about this, about this, and you got a dozen knowledges together and you think you know, but now I know. Thank you so much. May God bless you. I don't even know what to say, but I want to say that may God bless you so much, so much, and so much. And thank you for opening my mind every day. Even today, I'm, I wasn't feeling good, but I was like, I'm not going to sleep. At least I will be there and listen. But thank you, and I thank God I managed to finish the class. So, but may God bless you. God bless thank you, you too. so much. God bless yeah. you. God bless you too, Bella, and have yourself a wonderful evening in Uganda. I want to thank all of you who were with us this evening in the class of steel. And, and I want to encourage you 
to always remember the information that we share is not something that we're trying to create an environment as if the class of Steve is greater than any other class. The information is actually available on websites, on YouTube. It's easy to access it. I believe that we just take the time in the class of Steve to teach you, to share it with you, to break it down, to make it more palatable, to make it more accessible for you so that you can know exactly where to search. The United Nations is not a one class, one month, one week, one year training. If some cases take five and 10 years to, to complete in some dynamics, could you imagine learning about an organ where you have so many different arms and so many different organs to deal with? It's not gonna take one class, but the class of steel, we endeavor to give you as much information as we could and help equip you to be a better citizen. And, and I would use the term a better global citizen to be globally minded and globally relevant. And as you travel throughout the corridors of power in government and, and other organizations, you're equipped and you know how to do things the correct way. Thank you so very much for being in the class of Steel this evening. I'm Dr. Michael Steele. Thank you for Her Excellency Jeannie Steele, my, my beautiful wife and right hand. Her Excellency Doreen Burungi, who is our COO. His Excellency Dr. Donald Ewers, who is our Chief of Protocol. His Excellency Olusogun Olukoya Olusogun, who is our Youth Coordinator, and also individuals who are on board with us in all that we're doing pertaining to the Leaders Without Borders Development Center and our family. Good night and God bless you and see you in the next class. Good night, everybody.